What's up guys? Now that the 14ers have been officially completed, today's video is going to talk about ranking them and getting my overall thoughts about the 14ers. Uh, so this video could be super, super long if I got into a ton of details. So I'm going to go ahead and really, I always say link below, but really take a look at it this time because I'm going to put a little bit of notes about each mountain, um, which I think will be helpful. So let's kind of start this whole thing off by saying that anytime you rank something, there's going to be people who disagree with it. Lists are super, super, super uh, subjective to the person, your experience, and, and all of that. So let's, uh, let's just start by a couple of things and just some overall thoughts and uh, facts about me and uh, hiking the 14ers. So uh, it took me just over uh, four years to do them. So I did four in 2015, 20 in 2016, 20 in 2017, 12 in 2018, and two in 2019. Uh, so that's uh, 58 total. Uh, I soloed 46 of them. Uh, Juno, my dog, was with me with uh, on nine of them. And of course, uh, completed all four of the great traverses along the way. Uh, if you're not familiar with what those are, we'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, so I wouldn't consider any of them easy. They're all uh, harder hikes. Like um, they're not going to be something that you can just jump right into if you're just like an average or intermediate hiker um, without being tired the next day. Uh, so there's a lot, with a lot of them, there's huge variables to them. So uh, that would be like the time of year you're hiking them, the snow level, uh, the amount of snow from the, the season before, the shape of the road, the kind of car you have. So with a lot of the approaches, um, you know, and I'll kind of talk about a few of those once we get into the specific mountains, um, you know, that will have a big effect um, on your overall like experience and how difficult that would be uh, for you as an overall hike. So the 14ers, in my opinion, are like a really cool way to explore the state, to um, get to know it if you're new to here, if you're not new to here, kind of figure out new uh, areas that you want to go back to, whether that be just uh, sections of the state, mountain ranges, breweries, restaurants, whatever. It's, it's a really cool way to kind of get out there and, and see more instead of just sticking to the area that's close to you. Uh, it's also a great way to progress through hiking. So if you're a new hiker, if you're uh, wanting to kind of get to more serious stuff, there's a really kind of easy way to do that. Really in general, if you kind of follow the rankings I have in the link below and what I'm going to talk about in a second, it, you know, if you kind of work through the order of those, it's really a natural progression to kind of get to the, the harder peaks. Okay, so one other quick note before we get into things. So when I rank the 14ers, depending on the categories, the things that I'm going to keep in mind are three things. Mileage, the amount of technical hiking, and the type of technical hiking, so how high it goes up in the technical hiking spectrum. And then number three, the total elevation gain. So if you look uh, up these mountains, depending on the categories, it'll make a lot of sense why they're in each one. There might be a couple that maybe are ranked higher or lower on, on other people's lists, but for me, that's why we are where we are. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. Let's first talk about the four great traverses. A little background, they're from uh, Jerry Roach, who's a famous mountaineer here in Colorado, really across the country as well. Um, so, what are those four? Little Bear Blanca, Crestones Traverse, so Crestone Peak, Crestone Needle, El Diente Traverse, so El Diente, Mount Wilson, and then Maroon Bells, North Maroon, Maroon Peak. So let's go in order, and I will order these ones. The rest of them, they're kind of be categories, but these I can definitely order. Little Bear Blanca is without a doubt the hardest, most exposure, ton of route finding, uh, just a super, super exposed, thin, uh, ridge line with a lot of loose rock and it's also a really long approach so that's number one number two would be the maroon bells similar notes long approach a lot of exposure class four and five moves along the way a ton of route finding and conditions notorious in the elks very very loose as well number three would be the crestone traverse Crestone Needle, Crestone Peak. You go peak to needle. There's a very uh, minimal but 
a class five move along the way uh, that is pretty legit. And then there's two highly exposed class four sections. There's a mini knife edge right after the class five move. And then of course the infamous head wall. I will say why this one kind of moves to number three over the maroon bells is that the exposure um, that you deal with has a lot of solid rock. So it's Crestone conglomerate. It's the type of rock in this mountain especially on Cresto Needle, that is just super solid. You really never guess about your holds there. And then finally, the El Diente to Mount Wilson Traverse, uh, which obviously, if you've seen my video, I summited kind of later in the day, almost at night, um, which had a ton of um, loose rock, but it was mostly class three, a couple um, maybe class four moves if you got off route, minimal route finding, but again, a long approach. And so all of those really, if you do them together, are at the top of the list, like no question. Those are definitely the hardest. Um, so let's talk about individual peaks now. For the individual mountains, as I said earlier, I wouldn't consider any of them easy. So I'm gonna break them down into kind of categories here, and that'll go hardest, hard, more difficult, moderate, and then easier. So let's start off with the hardest peaks. I've touched on a bunch of them already, uh, but those will be the following and I'll have a list. Let's start off with two we've already talked about. Maroon Peak, North Maroon Peak, Snowmass, Capital, Crestone Peak, Crestone Needle, and then of course, Little Bear. Again, these are not in specific order, but just uh, the category itself. You could argue all day about what's the toughest. Uh, so, the ones I didn't touch on already, snow mass, super, super long approach, like 22 miles, uh, class three, almost definitely requires backpacking unless you're a super, super fast hiker, extra weight, extra gear, that's gonna be tough. Uh, capital speaks for itself, the knife edge, one of the most, if not the most uh, exposed move on a standard 14er route, class four, and of course, a ton of loose rock and a long approach for that one too. Uh, Crestone Peak and Needle we already touched on, um, but I would say the big variable for those two is if you are able to drive up to the upper trailhead of South Colony Lakes, maybe they're a little bit less difficult, but still uh, hiking them individually or together, you still have a ton of elevation gain and then loss going over Broken Hand Pass. Um, so that's for sure tough. Touched on Little Bear Peak in my video of Little Bear Peak, obviously, but um, the reason why it's so tough is Lake Como. Again, if you can drive all the way up to Lake Como, it really, um, you can maybe bump it down a couple categories, but assuming you can't, uh, it's tough. The technical moves are not as high as some of the others on this list, perhaps, but the rock fall is without a doubt the most uncomfortable I've ever felt. Uh, I've gotten into arguments on the internet, go figure about this. Uh, but uh, for me, I felt the most unsafe with just rock shooting down the hourglass, so that's no joke. Next up, we have hard peaks, and that would be the following. So we got Pikes Peak, we got Pyramid Peak, we have Mount Wilson, we have Sunlight Peak, we have El Diente, Elos, North Elos, Wyndham, Blanca, and Ellingwood Point. And so you can tell that all the Chicago Basin ones are in this group. Uh, again, super big variable. If you hike in via Purgatory, you could arguably make the case that all of those four Chicago Basin ones bump up to hardest. Uh, for us, it's a super long approach. If you take the train in, still a long hike, still a hard hike, still multiple days, most likely, so you're carrying all that extra weight. Huge factor there. Uh, Pikes Peak, many will maybe be surprised this is this high up. The reason I put it there is because I did it in one day. So it was like 24, 26 miles, depending on who you ask. Uh, and uh, even if you do do it in two, it's a lot of mileage. And uh, again, bringing that uh, camping gear. Pyramid Peak, uh, class four exposed, but in my opinion, a fun one, but a ton of elevation gain for that. Um, and then yeah, Blanca and Ellingwood typically hike together. Again, if you come from Lake Como, long approach. If you go from the other side, the Crestone, uh, excuse me, the Zapata Falls side, still a long approach there too. Moving on to more difficult, more difficult peaks. So these are gonna be the Elbert, Quandry, Longs, Mount Ontario, Challenger, Wetterhorn, Wilson, uh, Mount Lindsay, Mount Massive, Mount Harvard, Castle Conundrum, Mount of the Holy Cross, Mount Oxford, and then Tab 
uh, Tabagashi Peak. So that's the more difficult category. I'm not going to go over each one. Check the link below if you want to read notes, but a couple of ones. So Mount Elbert, again, maybe people surprised here. Maybe they're surprised it's not higher. It is the tallest 14er in the state, along with Massive Second, uh, which are both in this category, uh, but very, very steep hikes and pretty decent mileage as well. Um, I would say that Mount Ontario, if you have a 4x4 car that can get you to like the base of the the ridge, which many of you may, then that would be bumped all the way down to easier. I mean, it takes away all of that mileage, and certainly that's a huge reason why it's up here for me. Um, Castle and Conundrum, interesting ones, because if you hike them together, which most people do, uh, you, in the spring, have a super, super steep snow uh, gully or runnel, depending on the, the amount of snow, so you're going to need some mountain axe skills there to safely descend it, and if you're coming in the summer, it, well, all of that turns into loose uh, trail conditions there. Quandry Peak, why is that so high? Well, Quandry Peak is a very steep hike. It's super popular, but um, I would say that it's uh, very under ranked in terms of difficulty because it's basically from the car to the summit just straight up and uh, decent amount of mileage there as well. Side note quickly, Quandry is a cool one to hike in the winter uh, to ski or snowboard or just to get some winter hiking in because the trailhead access is so good all year long. One of my favorite mountains, uh, Wetterhorn Peak, is in this uh, group as well. I find that Wetterhorn Peak was just a really cool overall hike. I really want to go back and do the Matterhorn Wetterhorn Traverse, which I haven't done yet. Um, and just, uh, yeah, nice overall and beautiful looking uh, peak. Moderate peaks. So what are those? San Luis, Huron, Grays, Calebra, Princeton, Humboldt, Sneffels, Red Cloud, Sunshine, Belford, Shivano, Missouri, La Plata, basically all of the collegiate peaks, it seems like, uh, Yale, and then Mount Columbia. A couple notes on these ones specifically. So, Princeton, again, depending on how high you, how high you can drive, might be bumped down to an easier peak. Uh, Humble Peak, again, if starting from the upper trailhead, uh, might be a little easier as well. But I'm assuming, in this case for me, because I did it from the lower trailhead, that's why it lands in the moderate category. Rays and Tories, super, super popular as well. I would say that this is the, the one group of mountains that in future years has the potential to move up. And the reason I say that is because the 4x4 approach road deteriorates every single year. And so people are having to park farther and farther down, which adds mileage and elevation gain to that hike. Quick note here, Calebra, the only privately owned 14er in the state that you have to pay a fee on. There's a ton of privately owned 14ers, uh, Shivano, Tab, uh, really the Decalibron, all four of them are theoretically on private land, and there's a handful others, but that's the only one you have to pay for, and it's a huge wild card. So in the future, if you're looking to knock out the 14ers, take Calebra whenever you can, because the land owners there could theoretically at any day just say hey no more hikers here I, I hiked Harvard and Columbia together so a nice little traverse there as well uh, and again that traverse was pretty difficult because of the amount of route finding and the poor trail conditions that it had so let's finish this list with easier peaks again I wouldn't say they're easy but easier Handys, Sherman, Lincoln, Cameron, Bross, Bierstad, Uncompagre, I can never say that right, so please feel free to correct me below. Uh, Mount Democrat, and then finally Mount Evans. So a couple notes here as well. So Handy Speak, again, a, a mountain that, depending on how high you can drive up, that might move up maybe one category. Um, the Tecalibron together, certainly you notice that all four of them are here. I would say, obviously you have to go up Bross or uh, Democrat to get to the other two, but once you're up on the ridge line, getting the camera and getting to Lincoln are not that bad. It's it's really just that initial descent, ascent. Bross, again, a mountain with really poor trail conditions, so definitely not an easy hike, but easier. Uh, and then Mount Evans, too. If you're doing Beerstad, taking the Sawtooth over to Evans, and then back down through the willows, definitely bump that up a category. But if you're just doing Mount Evans from Summit Lake, which many people do, um, that would definitely be an easier hike as well. That wraps up our list of the 14ers. Again, ranked not specifically by the order I mentioned, but by category. Um, I'm sure there'll be people who disagree. Hey, I welcome it. Throw your, throw your uh, thoughts in the comments below. And uh, yeah, just a couple other things I want to touch on. So people are going to ask, which ones can I bring my dogs on? I have the answer for you. Go to any of 
the 14 ers I have on my website, thevirtualsherpa.com. And every single one of the write-ups has a section about dogs. Again, it's going to be super contentious based on who you are, based on who your dog is. But I try to be honest about which mountains are dog friendly, which mountains are definitely not dog friendly, and which ones maybe depending on your dog. So be sure to check that out on the website for each mountain you want to hike. Um, finally, I have a question that was asked, what are the highs and the lows of the 14ers for me? Well, the highs, really, there's too many to answer, but in general, it's the moments when I was on the mountain by myself, a beautiful sunrise, a beautiful sunset, maybe with uh, my wife, maybe with uh, my dog, but just being in a secluded part of nature and the moments that were kind of uncomfortable for me. So, you know, summoning the El Diente Traverse just as the sun went down or same thing on San Luis Peak in super remote Colorado with just my dog and myself not really familiar with the area. The lows, well everybody knows from watching my videos or just hiking it yourself there are certainly times where you can say you're having a type 3 or type 2 fun kind of a day. Basically type 3 fun is definitely part of the 14ers, it's part of hiking, it's part of part of mountaineering, it's part of dealing with nature, it just happens. Uh, but ultimately I feel like those tough times really just make you appreciate the times that wow everything went super smooth, the weather was beautiful, there were no issues. Uh, but the overall maybe biggest low uh, for sure uh, was getting stuck on the summit of uh, Mount Shivano with Juno, a, th a thunderstorm just literally rolled out of nowhere and you know caught us way off guard and it was a lightning storm striking the mountains right around us, super scary, but luckily we uh, escaped uh, unscathed. And finally, just one kind of overall note about the 14ers. Um, you know, everybody always says this, but I can't stress it enough. There is no reason not to turn around if you don't feel comfortable with it, if the weather isn't cooperating. This is, sure, you know, it's ultimately a list checking off thing, but you want to enjoy the moment and live in the moment and not die in the moment. You want to be able to come back and summit that next day. So even if it's your goal to hike all 58, to hike the Centennials, to hike all the 13ers, whatever it may be, just keep in mind that the mountains are not going anywhere. It sucks to hear that. It's really annoying, but it's very true. They will outlive all of us. I can assure you that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I really hope that uh, you guys have enjoyed my 14er videos so far. I know I've missed a couple, so the plan next season or maybe even this season if the weather cooperates is to go back and shoot footage on those. Thanks for watching this video. I know there's going to be a ton of thoughts about this, so be sure to put your thoughts, arguments, concerns, questions, whatever in the comments below. Please subscribe not to miss any future hike reviews. And as I said at the beginning of this video, be sure to check out that link below of the blog talking about the 14ers because I have notes on everything and I think it'll be helpful. But anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. 